Uh, let's continue. Uh, you remember we were looking at 11 dimensional supergravity. You remember that the fields were A mu nu rho and G mu nu uh, and plus psi mu alpha uh, under the condition that gamma mu psi mu alpha is equal to zero. And so called Rita Schwinger spinner. You remember that we counted components. We got, I think, 44 here. Yeah. Uh, and we got what, 84 here? Uh, 44 and 84. Yes. And we found 128 here. We were happy. <laughs> OK. Um, we also talked about the dimensional reduction. We talked how this guy went to B mu nu and uh, C mu. Now we talked about this guy went to the dilaton, the metric, and uh, uh, the gauge field, the kaluza gauge field. OK. Um, uh, OK, excellent. Now, by the way, we could um, also ask. Not C mu, but C mu nu alpha. I mean, C. Oh, that's C. Uh, thank you, thank you. OK. Uh, by the way, we could also ask, um, uh, uh, we could also ask, what does, um, what does the uh, uh, spinner descend to? OK. Um, so uh, OK. Uh, let's 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 figure that out. Chiral and antichiral spinner spinning. Uh, chiral and antichiral, but remember, this is not just a plain spin. Plain spin, yeah. Okay, it's got this vector index as well. So uh, what's the deal with that? Okay, uh, roughly speaking, you know what's going on is very simple. There's one extra vector okay. index here. Yeah, that will just be a, a spinner without any vector index. Okay, yeah, let's do it by counting. Yeah. What we had was psi mu alpha gamma mu, uh, psi mu alpha such that psi mu alpha gamma mu is equal to zero. Okay, now uh, we break this up into ga into mu is eleven and i. Yes. Okay, so we have psi eleven alpha and psi al i alpha. Okay, this is clearly by itself a Radita Schwinger type spinner. We still have to impose the con constraints. And this is clearly an ordinary type spinner. OK. Now, the first thing about it, forget about the constraints and forget about the extra vector indices for a moment. OK. The first thing about, uh, about it is that an 11-dimensional spinner is a 10-dimensional spinner of both chiralities. Yes. Yeah, same number of gamma matrices, except, except that there's additional gamma 5, so you can't have Okay, so each of these is a spinner of both chiralities. Yes. Okay, ignoring the constraints, this is a vector times both chirality spinner, mm -hmm. and this is an ordinary both chirality spinner. Okay, now what do the constraints do? The constraints tell us that gamma 11 of this plus gamma i this is equal to zero. Okay, so. Uh, From the point of view of counting, yeah. if we leave this free, then gamma i psi i alpha is set to something particular. Yes. Okay? So the degrees of freedom in 10 dimensions are clearly that of a 10 dimensional guy with gamma i psi i alpha se set to something, so set to zero for instance. Because whatever it is is completely determined in terms of the other degree of freedom. You can subtract out something yes. from here. Okay, so define a slightly redefined spinner. OK? Uh, and then in addition, there are these spinners. So what's the conclusion? This is a 10-dimensional Radita Schwinger spinner, yes. but one of each chirality. OK? So we have two 10D RS spinners, but one of each chirality. So we'll call it 1, 1. We'll always count spinners with the chirality. And two ordinary spinners. 
1 comma 1, 10 D, ordinary spinners. Let's count components. It's sort of guaranteed to work, but let's count it anyway. Uh, in 10 dimensions, uh, we would have 2 to the 5 components in a spinner, but the number of chiral spinners has 2 to the 4. Uh, no, no, we should be counting uh, little groups, sorry. It's in 8 dimensions. Yes. Uh, we would have 2 to the uh, 4 spinners, but chiral spinners have 2 to the 3. Mm. So each chiral spinner has 8 components. Mm. Okay. Well, let's say that we solve for this part, the gamma i psi i part, in terms of gamma 11 psi 11. Yes. So gamma i psi i is not a degree of freedom. Yes. Once we know this, we know gamma i psi i. So the independent degrees of freedom are those, uh, these such that gamma i psi i is equal to 0. OK, so the independent degrees of freedom are a Raita Schwinger spinner, in 10 dimensions, well, two of them, one of each chirality. And an ordinary spinner, one of each chirality. Right? So totally how many, so each chiral spinner has eight components. Totally how many chiral spinners do we have? Eight times, and also eight. Exactly. So we had one from here, yes. and apparently eight from here. Yes. But there's one equation, so that's seven from here. So totally eight. But uh, there are, uh, each of them is chiral, so 16. Yes. 16 components, which is our 128. OK, so the field content of type 2a supergravity is two normal spinners, two Rarita Schwinger spinners. OK, and then there is uh, uh, the graviton, B mu nu, phi. These are the nice NSNS -NS sector fields of string theory. And these two are the Ramon Ramon sector fields of, of strict theory. And then the, 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 the spinner content. All good? OK, excellent. Now, what we want to understand more clearly is all the gauge invariances of the theory and how the gauge transformations act on all fields. OK, and here we're going to encounter a little surprise. Um, uh, a little surprise, which we, which we which we'll see. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is look at the dimensional reduction for, of the metric properly. We've done this before in class, but I just remind you again. The good way to do dimensional reduction is to take g mu nu. So I'll use mu nu for 11 dimension and ij for 10 dimension. OK. And write it as e to the power 2 phi, or maybe it's 2 sigma phi phi. OK. e to the power 2 phi times dx11 yes. plus a mu, uh, a i, let's go. What a i gives? dx i, the whole thing squared, plus g i j dx i d. So this phi, this phi is going to be the scalar field that we talk about. Yeah. This a i is going to be the vector field that we talk about. And this g i j is going to be the metric field that we talk about. Yeah. Now, how you choose phi is not very important. And in fact, we'll repeatedly redefine that. Yes. But how you choose the a i is very important. And why is that? It's because a i has a gauge invariance. Yeah. And we want to choose that the definition of the field is that it has the usual Maxwell gauge invariance. OK? So let's understand that very clearly. Once we have put this thing in this form, nothing in the theory, no function in the theory is allowed to depend on x11. That's the whole point of dimensional reduction. Yes. Now we can ask, given that, what coordinate changes are we allowed to make? OK? So clearly, we're allowed to take xi uh, prime is equal, or xi is equal to xi plus, uh, uh, let's say, some function of xi. Yeah, I mean, xi is a function of x. Yeah. Whatever, j, j prime. Okay. Uh, xi don't change. What? Oh. Xi don't 
I can make a diffeomorphism. Oh, yes. yeah. Clearly, nobody can stop me from doing that 10 dimensional diffeomorphism. And that will be the gauge invariance of 10 dimensional gravity. Yes. That's not the surprising thing. The interesting thing is note that we cannot make the new xi, uh, you cannot make the old xi functions of xi prime and x11 prime. Why not? Because all these functions here were functions of xi. And if we make the xi functions of xi prime and x11 prime, then these functions will now become functions of x11 prime. But that's not allowed by our rules. Okay? So this is not allowed. But what about this? x11, nobody can stop us from doing this, is equal to x11 plus, uh, let's say, uh, chi of xi. The reason was that the only place x11 appeared was here. And if we put this in, this retains the form of the metric with the redefined definition of AI. And what is the redefinition of AI? It is that AI goes to AI plus del i chi. Actually, minus in this way of. OK. okay. <laughs> I'm not going to keep track of that. <laughs> OK. So this is clearly a usual gauge transformation. OK. Excellent. So this is a good way to do the, uh, to, do the uh, uh, to, to define your fields. And we must remember, whenever we think of the gauge transformation, that the gauge, what was behind the gauge transformation? It was this coordinate redefinition. This is the thing that will help us understand how every field in the problem transforms under gauge transformations. Now, what do I mean by every field? You might wonder. Well, all, clearly phi is invariant. Clearly gij is invariant. Only ai transforms, you might think. But hold on, there was also that aijk. OK? So now let's figure out how AIJK transforms under gauge transformations. A mu nu. A mu nu alpha. How does this, this fellow uh, transform under gauge transformations? <laughs> well, first, how does it transform under diffeomorphisms? That's obvious. If there's an 11, it's invariant under the diffeomorphisms. The IJs transform like vectors under those diffeomorphisms. Nothing surprising there, right? OK? Everything interesting is about how this guy transforms, uh, uh, transforms under this, 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 uh, this fellow. OK? So uh, let's see. Let's first write down the rules. So we'll always deal with lower index guys. OK? When one index is 11, the other two are Exactly. So now let's try to get uh, some, uh, okay, some su some signs. Should I try it? Okay, let's <laughs> <laughs> let's try to get some signs right. <laughs> okay, uh, let's let's try. Okay. So, uh, what's the rule for transformation of a of a derivative? Right. So del by del x eleven. Okay. Let's first remember the general rule. Del by del y is equal to del x by del y, del by del x. That's the general rule. Now we'll apply this general rule. We'll make either y prime. Uh, l let's say that we want to know what the old guys become. So let's make y unprime. So del by del x mu is equal to del x mu prime by del x mu del by del x mu prime. OK, now new prime and uh, new defer. Uh, the, now, now let's work this out in more detail. First, del by del x11. OK, that is equal to, and of course, under this thing, xi is equal to xi prime. Yes. OK, so this was going to be equal to something uh, by x11, so del 
by uh, but the only thing that depends on x x11 prime it's, it's there we'll just do that in our head so oh, the only thing that depends on x11 is x11 prime and it depends on it linearly so del by del x11 is del by del x11 prime so a lower index 11 index does not transform sort of a bit paradoxical right what I could, but there's no reason to, right? Because that is just normal diffeomorphisms. Those transform by the usual rules of 10-dimensional diffeomorphisms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that has nothing new. It's just 10-dimensional diffeomorphisms. This is the transformation in the 11 dimension which becomes gauge transformations. Gauge transformations. We want to see how everything transforms under gauge transformations. Okay, so del by del x11, nothing, nothing new. Okay. But del by del xi, okay, this is equal to del now x11 del by del xi prime, del by del x11 prime plus del by del xi prime. Okay, but del by del x11 by del xi prime, uh, uh, x11 prime with the minus, I'm not sure how far I keep track of signs. Okay, uh, so what we're getting is theta i is equal to minus del i zeta. Uh, I zeta del by del uh, theta 11. Theta 11 prime. For any object with a lower index. Plus theta what? Yeah, plus theta i. Plus, plus, yes. <coughs> Delta theta i. The theta, uh, the, uh, every vector, anything with a lower index, changes under this strange gauge transformation. Notice that this guy didn't have an 11 index. Yes. EI was born with 10 indices. Okay? So, so fine. So there's no, uh, uh, it you know, it's, there's no change in, in in AI. Okay, but uh, uh, but uh, the object that we that was an independent fellow, which is a mu nu rho, could have had an eleven index. Okay. So what is our change, what is our rule, our gauge transformation rule for uh, a mu nu rho? A, uh, well, let's do first 11 mu nu yeah, delta 11 of 11 ij, 11 ij, good. 11 ij, delta of this, we get pick up a factor of this for each, each of these indices is equal to minus del i zeta, okay, but what we're supposed to do is to replace i by 11, yes. and that's 0. Because we get two 11s, and this a was anti-symmetric. Right. Okay, so, so this is equal to 0. On the other hand, if we take delta a, what do we call it, c. The ij came. Yeah, c ij, exactly. Okay, that is equal to minus del i zeta c 11 j k okay plus anti is this clear so you see something rather strange anti symmetric in this anti symmetric 
I J K L. That 11 is in the same position. Same position. Same position. So it was, I mean, yeah, we could just work it out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each of these. Okay. You'll always get an 11, and then the other two. 11 will be in the middle for the second term. Yeah, I mean, that that net answer will be anti-symmetric, right? <laughs> you just work it out. Because, because the left hand side was anti-symmetric. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, all good? So where are we? So we found that this three-form field transforms under the Maxwell gauge invariance. Now, the three-form field also had its three-form gauge invariance. Remember, in 11 dimensions, it had a gauge transformation. Okay, so let's now keep track of those gauge invariants. Okay, so good. So we've understood now how, let's write it down. Under delta AI, what was it? Uh, Upani minus delta I zeta. We got uh, uh, delta CIJK is equal to minus del i um, zeta c 11 j k plus s. I won't swear that all these signs are relatively right. Anyway, we can change them by writing dx 11 minus. Yeah, assume the a 11 is 1. Why? Why? Oh, oh, it is that just coming from the gauge. Gauge transformation. No, I thought, yeah. There was no a 11. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, from this rule. From this rule. That's, that's the point. This rule doesn't yeah. apply to a. Because yeah. A is not an 11-dimensional tensor. This only applies to 11-dimensional tensors. <laughs> okay? So, so we figured out everything trans transforms under the U1 gauge transformation. Now let's also figure out how everything transforms under the three-form gauge transformation. Okay? So what was that? We had... Uh, I think we called it A as a three form. So let's call it B just so that we won't confuse this, right? Let's call it B3. This is the 11B3 form. I'm sorry for constantly changing notation. Hope you don't mind. Oh, no, let's not call it B. B is a D. We call it D. Okay. Sorry, I just the A's part. Anti symmetrized. You see? Oh, it's yeah. Because we have three terms. Okay, so now let's take this 11 dimensional 3 form. Let's call it D3. And we had delta D3 was equal to D, some 2 form. Let's call it theta. Okay, and uh, this is some fancy way of saying that D delta D mu nu rho is equal to del mu uh, theta nu rho. Plus. You just put the square brackets if you like. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Right? Fine. Now, uh, let's let's look at what oh, oh, at, you know what we're going to do. Of course, what we're doing is breaking up D into things with eleven components. And things without. Okay? Uh, nothing in our game will have any 11 dependence. So all 11 derivatives will be 0. Okay. So let's see. First, let's look at what happens to D11 alpha beta. Okay? So our, what? Alpha ij. Alpha ij. Thank you. Okay, so now look, we had D11, we also had theta, which had theta 11 i and theta ij. Okay, now we want a D11, no 11 derivative is allowed, so we must be coming from um, a theta 11 ij. Okay, so this is going to be equal to uh, del i theta 11j minus del j theta 
11 i right again i'm yeah. doing it i'm not sharing many every sign right every overall sign right you will fill that out right right yeah. that's great what it tells us is that this theta 11 i um, is remember d 11 i j was b mu nu okay so what we concluded now is that delta of b i j is equal to d of theta 11, theta 11, 1. Yes. So the part of theta that has an 11 index is now one form. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and is the gauge parameter for, for the B field, for the B field transformation of type 2A theory. Is this good? Finally, we need to figure out what happens to finally we need to figure out what happens to D D I J K. Okay, so we need to take delta of this. Okay? Now exactly. Here here we can't we're not interested in any theta eleven. So this is just is equal to D theta 2, right, so this is very simple, delta B theta 3, we, now let's call it C, yeah. the 10 dimensional yes. 3 form is delta of theta 2. So this rule is very simple, it's simply that the IJ indices of the gauge transformations of uh, the 11 dimensional 2 form gauge transformations. Gauge parameters, sorry, two form gauge parameters become the two form gauge parameters for 10 dimensional three form gauge symmetry. Whereas the 11 i indices of the two form gauge parameters become the gauge parameters for the 10 dimensional one for, uh, uh, two form gauge symmetry. I hope the various numbers of forms and symmetries. I mean, parameter has one less index than. You know, all that, yeah. Anyway, we're going through all that in our journal clubs as well, right? Indra Neil is taking us through all that. Same, same kind of business. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so this is as you would expect, and it's just that the here the gauge transformations descend in a very straightforward way from 11 to 10 dimensions. Both the gauge parameters and the gauge transformations just descend, and there's no mixing with anything. Because only a transform, only a, in, a you know whatever d in three, ten dimensions transformed under this funny transformation. The reason that mixed, that zeta mixed, is that every tensor transforms under coordinate change, including the a's, including the d's. Okay, so what we have now, we'll ra ra okay. So this is good. I'm gonna. So we'll now, we have delta C under the three form, under the, let's call it delta, well, I'm calling it two because it's a two form gauge parameter, is equal to D theta two. Yeah, and diffeomorphism, yeah. diffeomorphism, I'm not even going to write them. Yeah, I mean, the upper part, the change of uh, the forms because of diffeomorphism. Because of 11, the funny 11D diffeomorphisms which become yes. color, uh, Maxwell gauge transformations in 10 dimensions. Okay, so now delta V is equal to uh, D theta 1. Okay, this is exactly as you would expect. This is a little funny. Okay, so now that we understand all of this, we can now ask, what should the form of the dimensionally reduced action look like? Now, of course, this is a clean exercise, right? All you have to do is take the 10 dimensional, uh, 11 dimensional action I wrote down for you last time, plug in the decomposition which we've so clearly stated, and you get what you get. But whatever you get is guaranteed to be gauge invariant under these gauge transformations. 
and therefore you can already guess some structural features. Okay, so let's try to figure that out. First, first let's look at uh, gauge invariance under um, gauge invariance under. Uh, yeah. yeah. Which one? D when yeah. D. Sorry. No, D. Yeah, sorry. D is I when C2. C2. Uh, C, uh, C, exactly. This will be uh, right. But it's nothing to do with any of the thetas. Uh, yes. That's diffeomorphism in gauge That's right. So we can call that C112, we can call it B. Right? Because that's what it was. Yes. So D's I wedge B. D's I wedge B. Okay? And I'm not swearing that all my signs are correct. Okay, so now let clearly, uh, fine, first let's write down things that are manifestly gauge invariant. Suppose this funny mixing had not been there, then there are three things we would have written down. We would have written down H is equal to DB. We would have written down, I don't know, call it E is equal to DC. And we would have written down F is equal to DA. And we'd have all been happy. We'd have written down Lagrangians squaring each of these field strengths. And we would have gone home happy. Okay? But now there is an issue. Because this DC guy is not by itself gauge invariant. It is nicely gauge invariant under theta 2 transformations. But it is not gauge invariant under U1 gauge transformations. Okay? Compensating. Exactly. So what do we do? DC so let's... Plus, uh, go on, go on. <laughs> DC Let, plus, uh, yeah. We can just figure out first yeah. how it changes. Okay, so what is delta E? Okay, so uh, delta E, now let's use uh, for, uh, this form notation as you, as you guys correctly pointed out, uh, is equal to delta of DC, which is equal to D of delta C, which is equal to D of D Z, zeta wedge B, which is equal to up to some sign uh, minus. So you're uh, trying to look at only the gauge transformation part. What? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yes. All good? Yes. Now, can you think of anything? that would have the same gauge transformation as this. I want to cancel it, right? A wedge H. Right, because A transforms like this, up to some sign, which we won't swear about. Uh, if we define E tilde equals DC plus or minus A wedge H, I'm going to just ad adopt the sign after all of this that Polchinski uses, okay, so that we can use those formulas. Uh, this object now is nicely gauge invariant under everything because H by itself was gauge invariant. Yes. Under everything, right? So if we make a Lagrangian out of this E tilde, okay, that will be nicely gauge invariant. Is this clear? What? I can't hear you. Louder. Will it be invariant under these? Sure, because DC is invariant and this doesn't. Okay. Right? So what you're doing is adding something that was manifestly invariant under those other additional transformations because it involved only H. 
The only thing under which it was not manifestly invariant was this A. But that was put in to make it gauge invariant. Okay, now let me get Pulchinsky's um, convention so that we stick to that. Is it plus or minus or what? Minus, he has a minus. Okay. It was a minus that time. Okay. Yeah. It was a minus, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, I'm so unsure of all the signs in the middle. So that, that requires another level of care. You think hard and so on. Many signs. All that we you do, sit and do carefully. Yeah, I mean it's there's no nothing deep about it, it's just to get the signs right. Okay. Uh, fine. Great. So now, what should our Lagrangian look like? We're looking at some two derivative Lagrangian. So what will it be? Well, um, there is this irritating scalar phi, which we're going to come to. Yeah. Okay. But I'm going to write that stuff involving that last. All these terms could have some some Multiple, phi. Yeah, it will be multiplied by by this by this phi, right? We'll into we'll that two phi. Exactly. Okay. So let's immediately get that straight. Uh, when we had a square root g. Yes. From there we'll get a e to the phi. Exactly. We'll get an e to the power uh, phi. Correct. Okay. So if we wrote it that way, we would get an e to the we will get e to the power phi. Um, and square root g? g uh, yeah, this is g10. g10, exactly. Now every g is, g10. now everything is now in 10 dimensional language. Okay. Um, now, and then now we'll keep track of everything sort of uh, carefully. Fine. Um, This guy could potentially have more phi. Okay, we'll come come to that in just a minute. Yeah. Uh, because there was this had an eleven index in it. Yeah. We'll come back to that in a moment. So first we'll first we'll let's do the simple things. First let's F I J, F I J. Clearly there'll be a term like this. Yes. Yeah, I mean with a phi coupling. With a phi coupling. This phi coupling. No, no, with it. another phi coupling there will be. Uh, because of the two inverse G. Yeah. Because, because of, of the G you're right. You're right. Actually, to the two five. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, maybe, 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 maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Positive volume one. Yes, 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 yes. Maybe. Kind of actually, if you take into a two five overall, like including the DIG also, then this kind of confusion will be. No, no. I mean, in the parameterization that you use, there will be e to the two five, so that the coefficient of x square will be e to the three five. Uh -huh. okay. You're probably uh, right. In the string frame. You're probably right. You're probably right. Yeah, in the Einstein frame, there will be the phi phi. Uh, Maybe some of the sign of Yeah, you're right. He has an e to the power 3 phi. Uh, uh, e to the power 3 sigma. I'm going to write this down and we'll justify this completely. Yeah. Uh, uh, e to the an extra e to the power 2, yes. two phi. Uh, okay, good. Uh, uh, well, let's write on this Einstein metric. Square root g r yes. plus e to the power 2 phi i j f i j. Okay. Then let's look at, uh, uh, then there was, there's going to be some something like this plus, d, plus e tilde square. Yes. And then there's going to be something like yeah, h uh, squared. h squared, but that probably also has some phi. Uh, because H came with a, uh, uh, H came w up from, the, uh, the B came from C11, yeah. A11. Yeah. Uh, so presumably there's an extra factor of E to the power minus 2 phi, right? Let's check that. That's right. So 
this as an e to the power minus 2 pi because it contracts with the g 11 11 yeah. upper yes okay and uh, yeah that had coming yeah. coming yeah so just let me get these right uh, what kind of cross term? Suggest one. F F E. What? F F E. C D F E. But that's not two derivative. Oh, oh, you want to. Our original action was two derivative. Okay. So when we dimensionally uh, reduce, you'll never pick up derivatives, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, e to the power minus sigma f three squared, and e to the power plus sigma f four squared. Perfect. Okay. This so far is perfect. And now, the churn Simons term that we had in 11 d that, uh, that will descend to a churn Simons term in 10 d, yes. right? Because re let's remember what that, that churn Simons term was. But let me get the scalar. Where is the scalar? Uh, scalar, scalar. Why doesn't Polchinski have the scalar? Uh, Okay, irritatingly enough, at least my version of Pulchinski has missed out the scalar. Let's see. So, uh, uh, the so scalar. scalar yeah, just I can't remember the factor, the e to the phi behind it. Let's see, just a minute. Just a minute. Uh, Usually, scale square of log. That we'll redefine. I mean, that can be. Yeah. You know, we can make it a del phi. The whole thing square, yes. right? By doing the th integration by parts. Yeah. Uh, I, I suppose. Just I hope it is the same e to the power phi outside. Uh, just one. Uh, yeah, but just uh, just in the dimensional reduction of that square, so in square root g, there's an e to the power phi, yes. and in r, yes. the r of course gives a del phi or del square. It gives it gives you a del square phi, yes. uh, but does it also have an e to the power? No, it, it has e to the minus phi, grand square e to the phi. E to the power minus phi, perfect. Minus phi. Yeah, yeah minus phi cancels that e to the phi, so. Naively, that would be that comes without anything, you uh, say. Without anything. Without a, but. Okay, so you, so you said this comes with an e to the power minus phi, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I w uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, no, there will no. be no kinetic. No, 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 that can't be, right? Can I say yeah, that? Yeah. No, 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 sorry. Yeah, tell me. R, uh, R5 is equal to R4 minus 2 del square sigma minus 2 del sigma. R5 is equal to R4. Minus two del square sigma. Minus two del sigma square. Minus two del sigma square. Perfect. So then, so then that should we just leave the e to the power of five there? What? That's fine. That's fine. I'm not keeping track of that. It's but just that the overall does not have an e to the power five. Yeah, yeah, that's right. What are we doing? Does not have. No, but then the square root g does. Yes, square root g does, but the r don't have. But no, 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 no. Okay, what I'm saying is that. Overall, it's e to the minus phi grad square e to the phi. So, oh wait, wait. That e to the plus phi. E. Squa I mean, square root g eleven was e to the power phi square root g ten. Yes. No. What I'm saying is that in uh, front of this r, this uh, lower dimensional r, yeah, uh, minus uh, r is equal to according to the formula yeah. I read out r ten. R ten mi minus minus del squared phi minus del phi squared. Yeah, so what my claim is, uh, what I'm claiming is that this can possibly be written as e to the minus phi. No, no, that, no, no. That. Grad square e to the phi inside. So overall e to the phi will cancel out. Well, okay, let's just work that out. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. But I'm, uh, all I'm so doing is... Exponential uh, so uh, what events you are... Uh, all I'm doing at the moment is integrating my parts to get, make this del phi square. So, yes. so see, okay. so this, this is, we agree that this is e to the power phi, yes. del square phi plus del phi, the whole thing squared with some coefficients. Yes. Yes. And square root g. Yes. Yes. Now, yes. this del square phi, yes. what I'm going to do is integrate one of the dels yes. by parts. That doesn't change that there's an e to the phi there, right. but it makes this a del phi, the whole thing right, square. Right, right, right. So the whole thing is an e to the power phi times del phi square with some number. Yes. Yes. Fine. Okay, so we all agree. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and then there is the churn Simon stuff. Okay. Uh, now, the numbers, please look up from. I'm just getting the structure at the moment, right? Okay. Um, now that there, there, there is a del, uh, there is the uh, churn simons term. So let's remember what was the churn simons term in eleven dimensions. In eleven dimensions, we had a three wedge f four wedge f four. Yes. Okay. So um, now I'm claiming that well, let's see what does this descent do. One of these indices has to be uh, has to be eleven. Okay, so if this index was eleven. You, what you'll get is b wedge uh, wedge what we called uh, e. Let's call it f four. Like wedge f four. I'm sorry to constantly change. This is just dc uh. dc three. Is this clear? Yes. Okay. And if this index was 11, what would we get? Well, this A3 has become what we call C. Yes. OK? And this will become H. Yes. If it was 11, because one of these yes. indices. Is. So we will get a C wedge H wedge F4. Yes. OK? So A2 wedge F4 wedge F4, that's our B wedge F4 wedge F4. And A3 wedge F3, A3 C wedge H wedge F4. Yeah, perfect. And with some relative coefficient, you can figure out, a coefficient of 1 with some sign, you can figure out by the fact that it descended from this. Now you might worry about various things. OK, you might worry about whether this term, this term is gauge invariant. Okay, you might worry in that. Look, um, uh, okay. So let's 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 worry about that. Under ordinary B transformations, this is gauge invariant yes. because this changes like d theta one, yes. and then it acts on these f's. Yes. But these f fours are not this fancy f four. It's not the corrected F4, okay? Yes. It's just plain old F4. Yes. And plain old F4 obeys the usual Bianchi identity. Uh, actually, this is worth noting. Uh, we had some corrected F4, F4 tilde, which was equal to F4 minus A wedge H. Now, let's look at what D of this F4 tilde is. D of F4 is 0 because it's D of C3. And d of this h is 0, yes. but d of a is not 0. So this is minus f2 wedge h. So this fancy f4 is not, does not be obey the Bianchi identity. Yes. The gauge invariant f4 obeys uh, an identity that is a modified Bianchi identity. Okay? So the fancy F4 obeys this modified Bianchi identity. What appears in the John Simon's terms, the normal F4. Okay, so under B gauge transformations, we're fine. Or under C gauge transformations, we're fine. But now, what about under uh, A gauge transformations? Okay, so let's check. So what is the transformation of this, this object under A gauge transformations? I'm clearing, clearing this. Um, so let's see. Let's take one of these. So for instance, let's take 
uh, this guy. So there was C wedge H wedge F4 integrated. Now we take delta of that. Now delta of F4 we just calculated here was minus zeta wedge H. Yes. Minus. Because of, because of C, right? What? Due to oh, no, sorry, 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 sorry. Yes. Yeah. That was F4 was DC. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Now. H. Uh, yeah, now is this zero or is it not zero? Not well, first we can, of course, integrate by parts if we wanted to and make this an F. So the C is what? C is the three, three form, right? So yeah. we can make this. So this is F4. Which one you are saying? C8F4. What? Yeah, I think you this are saying the C8F4. CHF. Yes? Yeah, this is the same sort of John Simon's CH invariance. Uh, let's see, let's see. The problem is that this is not, D of the everything else is not zero. H yeah. is it zero or not? We'll check. H is not necessarily zero. Let's check, let's check, let's check. Yeah. It's three indices, right? Yes. So it probably is zero, right? Because. A not zero. Uh, not F wedge F is not, not zero. But I think odd number of indices is zero. Ah, I see. Because you're interchanging an odd number of indices. Uh -huh. I think that's the reason this is zero. Okay, it's because it's like epsilon. Yeah, so we can shuffle orders around. You do this gauge transform, you get an F4 wedge, wedge after some shuffling, D zeta wedge H wedge H. Now what is this? This is this includes an epsilon alpha beta gamma theta or oh, alpha 1, alpha beta 1, gamma 1, alpha 2, beta 2, gamma 2, I mean, <laughs> what by the rest? Uh, H alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, H beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. Now we do the change of variables between uh, uh, alpha, alpha, oh God, I, I got wrong, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. Now relabel alpha 1, uh, alpha with betas. You pick up three signs, right? Yeah. Because it's odd. Odd. So that gives zero. Okay, excellent. What about the other guy? What about this guy? Okay. Now, this, why do we get zero for this? Let's see. Once. Ah, maybe these two cancel each other. Uh, it might well be. It might well be that these two cancel. Uh, uh, l l let's see. D firstly, each term, this will become d. This will become uh, d zeta wedge h. Yes. C and h are invariant under this term. Oh, so, sorry. This will become d zeta wedge h. And this will be, they'll, they'll go, uh, go and db will become a dh. It will become an h. So there'll be an H wedge H. What's it? Same reason. It's just zero. C and H are invariant under this term. What? C and H. C and H are invariant. invariant. Only F4 transforms. Okay. Here we get two such terms, but I'm saying each term is uh, is uh, zero. Sh uh, do you see this? Because the change in F4 is d zeta wedge H. Then you integrate by parts, and the d hits the b and becomes an H wedge H. So there's an H by H, and that's zero for the same reason. Okay, so though it wasn't completely visually obvious, these John Simon's terms are all gauge invariant under every gauge transformation of the theory. Of course, it was all guaranteed if you sat and did it by dimensional reduction. It was guaranteed because you started with something that was gauge invariant in 10, 11 dimensions. You land up with something that's gauge invariant in 10 dimensions. What is sort of interesting? is to see how it works. In particular to see, A, you get John Simon's terms. That's, okay, you had it in 11, you got it in 10. What's the big deal? What's really interesting is the appearance of this guy. This modified, uh, uh, two things. Uh, yeah, the modified field strength, which obeys a modified Bianchi identity, because C, the C that it had, transformed not just under its own gauge transformation, but because of it, under its neighbor's gauge transformation. Okay? 
this is a lesson to keep in mind because we were lucky in that we could get this type 2a supergravity by dimensional reduction from uh, a very simple supergravity, uh, namely the 11 dimensional gravity, supergravity. Okay? So, and then we saw with our eyes how this funny transformation property arose. Now, this is a template you should keep in mind whenever you're looking at a supergravity. Because we have not seen this before, it seems very odd. How do you have these other form fields of some, let's say, P form fields that transform under Q form gates of entry? But this is a template for how it happens. She shouldn't be surprised by it. It's just dimensional reduction, for instance, makes that happen. And this happens all the time in these supergravity theories. We will see it happen also in type 2b supergravity, but, uh, 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 but maybe that's next time. Okay, let, fine. Now, the last thing I wanted to do was a, was a scalar field redefinition. Okay, suppose I make this, the, the field redefinition e to the power, what, I, what I've called phi Polchinski called sigma, just, just to be, uh, just to be, just to be, uh, just to be careful. So, this g mu nu is equal to e to the power minus phi g mu nu. Okay? And phi Okay, uh, forgive me, I'm gonna switch phi to sigma, okay? <laughs> because it's the next thing he calls phi end. <laughs> okay, uh, e to the power minus sigma g mu nu, and then he defines sigma is equal to two phi by three. Okay, so let's do this second. Let's first just do this. What? Everything is now 10 dimensions. There's no more 11 dimensions. Okay. okay. Mu nu index? No, I mean. Mu nu index is. Ah, sorry. I do if you want. Sorry. Okay. Now, what was the point of this? Let's see how each of these trans each of these terms transform under such a wild transformation. This is going to the Einstein frame, right? No, this is going to the string frame. Uh, okay. We can then later. I see, okay, okay. This will bring to the string, string frame. frame. We want to go to the, the the fields in which perturbative string theory works. What is this frame? This frame is nothing. Okay. It's just the frame you got from dimensional reduction. When you did the dimensional reduction, you could have absorbed. It was like what you said, right? You could have put some factor of e to the power. Yeah. I think it's what, if we'd just done what you said, we would have automatically come into this, this sigma frame. Uh, there was a choice. The g i j there, we could have put whatever factor of the. Uh, you want to remove some terms? I want to make all terms in the NS, NS sector have the same e to the power sigma dependence. Because that's a coupling content, constant dependence. This we should identify with e to the power minus 2 times the delta. Mm -hmm. 1 by g squared. Exactly, it's a wild transformation on the matrix. So, uh, do we have th that symmetry? Is it allowed to? Do it's a field redefinition. You know, in physics, we're always allowed to re redefine fields. By doing a path integral, inside the integral, you can do a change of variables. Th there's no symmetry or something here. No, no, no. This is uh, there's just nothing. A just a redefinition. Yeah. In fact, that's the point because we're going to get a new form of the action after this field redefinition, which is more convenient for us. It's not a conformal supergravity. Yeah, yeah, it's not that this is, as it's you say, no? the same. it's not the same. In fact, the reason we're doing this is because we wanted to change into something nice. Okay, so let's take this term, this term, and this term. These are the terms that came from the NSNS sector in string theory, because they're the dilaton, the B menu field, and the metric, okay? And I'm going to look at each of these terms first. Okay, 
So first look at this term. First what is g square root g goes to e to the power minus 5, uh, uh, 5, right? Uh, times square root g. 5 sigma. 5 sigma square root g. And I hope he started with an, yeah, he also had an e to the power 2 sigma. Fine. In his, we, yes. our metric had an, our Kaluza Klein form had an e to the power 2 yes. sigma, so did he. Okay, fine. Minus 5 sigma. Yes. Right. R would go to e to the minus sigma. Ha. Ah. Now R, R mu nu with indices down is homogeneous in G and G has as many g's as g inverses. Yes. So r, as Manu says, has an extra factor of g inverse. <laughs> uh, exactly. And therefore picks up an extra e to the power sigma. So, so r goes to r times e to the power sigma. OK. So this whole term here becomes e to the power sigma plus sigma minus 5 sigma. So that's minus 3 sigma. So, so we get, let's keep some space here. Uh, okay, I'll just rub this out and we start. Beginning. e to the power minus 3 sigma uh, square root g r. Sigma absolutely inside. Inside. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. e to the power minus. 3 sigma square root gr. Okay. Now let's look at, say, this term. Okay. In this term, the only metric factors here were the metric inverse. That transformed exactly like r. Yes. So it's going to be, and this one was overall outside here. Yes. So it's going to have the same factor as r. Yes. And therefore, also, uh, it plus del sigma those things where this number will keep changing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the number will keep changing, but uh, 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 I, I'm not keeping track of that. And finally, there's this guy. Now this guy had three factors of G inverse because it's H I J A K L and then G I inverse, inverse metric. So this guy picks up three factors of e to the power sigma in addition from, uh, from what we got from the square root g. So it, this guy was e to the power minus 2 sigma to start with, times e to the power 3 sigma, times e to the power minus 5 sigma. OK. And, this, and, uh, and there's an e to the power sigma. Uh, and so we get plus 4, minus 7, so minus 3. All good. Okay. And of course, the fact that we made this 2 by 3 is to make this minus 3 sigma, minus 2 sigma. <laughs> <laughs> so that it is minus 2 phi. So that it becomes e to the power minus 2 phi, 1 over g square. But let's now also figure out what happens to the other guys. What happens to the uh, coupling with the other guys? The, the Ramon Ramon fields. Let's see how that works. So, um, there is this fellow. So, let's start with this. Now, we've got very experienced, right? We start with an e to the power 3 sigma. Oh, there's no uh, Dilaton coupling there, it seems. In the end, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. The Roman Roman fields do not have it in right. this number. Yeah. Okay. So we start with this, uh, with this e to the power 3 sigma. Yes. Then we pick up an e to the power minus 5 sigma. That's from square root g. Yes. And then we pick up an extra e to the power 2 sigma because yes. there are two factors of g inverse yes. in this coupling. Remember, our basic fields are always lower index fields because we will uh, demand that we, uh, uh, we work with forms. So that's why we're always saying it's factors of two G inverses rather than factors of two Gs, mm -hmm. if, if we had used upper, upper fields. OK, so as we've seen, there's no e to the power sigma here. So then we get plus square root G 
You get plus square root g. F squared. F squared. And it's actually the same here. Let's check it out. That's a four, four form. Or that was a four, four form. form. Exactly. Yeah. So there we started with an e to the power sigma. Yes. So it then e to the power minus four. five sigma and e to the power four sigma. Yes. So it's gone. Plus e tilde mod square. And finally, once we put in that sigma is equal to the sigma minus 2 phi, this becomes e to the power minus 2 phi. And then the John Simons terms, of course, didn't involve the metric at all, because they were just wage products. So they're not changed. OK? So this is the final form of our metric. And uh, then you can you know, look up all the numbers in Pulchinski. So Pulchinski is equations 12.1. Uh, 110A, 110B, 110C give you the full form of the uh, uh, the, fu uh, the full form of the metric in uh, uh, in these coordinates. Okay, um, now I think that's all I want to say about type 2A supergravity. Uh, we'll come back to looking at a massive type 2A supergravity at some point. Um, but uh, now it's time to move on to type 2B supergravity. But next time, guys. There are two chance episodes, some of the two. He's not got a, uh, Yeah, he had it in equation 12.1.4c. He just missed it out. So the same way that in 12.1.4, he's missed out the Delphi, Delphi thing, I think. Yeah, he has B2 wedge F4 wedge F4, but there's also A2, uh, there's also the A3 wedge F3. Uh, can that be transferred? No, it can't be. Oh, maybe it's, maybe it's, a, just a minute. Oh, uh, it, is, it 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 is. One of the D's we move to the other guys. That's right, that's right, that's right. Look, let's look at this. Yes. Take this and integrate by parts to get this. Yes. So that's, uh, uh, you're right, B wedge F4 wedge F4, which is the same as this. So I needn't have written them. They were actually the same. Yeah. So they're just one, some factor. OK. Excellent. Uh, ah, and in fact, in 12.1.4, he has this is equal to that. I thought he had the sum of them, but he had both of them. Yes. So these two terms you could write down, but they were actually the same. So you have any one of them. Yes, we could have done half as much work in trying to show gauge invariance. <laughs> OK, excellent. So I think that this is all that we, uh, uh, we want to say at the moment about type 2A supergravity. Uh, in our next class, we will talk about uh, uh, type 2B supergravity and type 1 supergravity. Um, the supergravities of type 2B theory, the heterotic string and type 1 theory. And uh, then we will go back to perturbative string theory and uh, uh, make a clean connection between the fields we see in the action and the vertex operators that we, uh, we talked about. As you will see, sometimes the vertex operators in the NSNS sector, they map to the fields. In the Ramon Ramon sectors, they map to the, sorry, they map to the, as you will see, the vertex operators in the NSNS sector uh, create the gauge dependent fields, whereas the vertex operators in the Ramon Ramon sector create the field strengths. Uh, and uh, the reason for that, roughly, is that a string is charged under the B field and it has energy, so it's charged under the metric and uh, sources the dilaton. But the field, the string itself does not source the Ramon Ramon field. But there's dipole moment under them. So it couples to them not by minimal coupling. So it doesn't couple to the, the gauge fields themselves. It's like a, an F dot S coupling. Some higher derivative. Kind exactly. Of yeah. Right? So that's what happens when you've got some dipole moment under. Yeah. Okay. But so that, that, that is what you would expect on general grounds, and we'll see that in detail. 
we'll go back, we'll remember all those things you love, right? All those super conformal ghosts. <laughs> 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 and we will see how it co corresponds. <laughs> okay. Okay.